Hi guys, welcome to another live episode of what is this? What talk show is this? Well, it's not a real talk show, right? This is uh, the late show with Inbraj. It's not a real talk show, but this is about real people with real stories, right? So, as an entrepreneur, I believe that we can learn a lot of things from any human stories. Uh, not necessarily has to be from other entrepreneurs. Uh, and I think in the last few episodes, we had some very interesting discussions. Uh, let's see. The first episode we we did talk about entrepreneurship, and then the second episode we spoke about three D printing to fight COVID nineteen, and then after that we discussed uh, uh, social entrepreneurship, social enterprises, uh, and that was a very interesting chat. And today we have another topic that's very close to my heart. It's about food aid, right? So especially during this MCO period, and uh, I think some of you may know that I myself have started an initiative called the uh, COVID nineteen grocery aid where we are raising funds and then we are sending grocery aid to families that have lost income during the MCO. Uh, so we have a team of volunteers who are working with me on this. And that aside, uh, today I have invited two amazing guests who are also in the same space, also helping with food aid. Uh, we have Sarah from Hunger Hurts and Nabil from Hunger Hurts, both of them from the same organization. So I'll welcome them in so that they can introduce themselves as well. Yeah, I think they're ready. Let me bring them on board. Hi. Hi, guys. Hi. Welcome to the show. So Hi. I just gave a very quick introduction. Hi, Nabil. You can hear me? We can't hear uh, Nabil. Yeah, we can't hear you. Is your mic on? Okay, we can't hear you. I think we need to we need to turn on your mic. Okay, so while you do that, uh, let's start with you, Sarah. I just did a quick intro, so we know your names, and then we know about the organization. You're with Hunger Hurts. Uh, yeah. So is it Hunger Hurts Malaysia or just Hunger Hurts? It's Hunger Hurts Malaysia. All right. So yeah. uh, I'll let you introduce yourself so you can tell us more about yourself, uh, okay. anything you want to share about yourself, and also about how you got involved in this initiative. Let's start okay. with that. So uh, hi, guys. My name is Sarah Mack. Um, I'm 24, um, still in chambering, but uh, on the side, I'm volunteering with Hunger Hurts. So I am the marketing director for Hunger Hurts. How I got into Hunger Hurts is because of Nabil. He actually um, pitched my name to the higher committee because he said he saw potential in me. That's how I got involved. Um, yeah, I've been in this organization for about a year plus. All right, and your primary role is marketing. Do you have a team or yeah. are you like on your um, own? Uh, I am the marketing director. There are three people under me. Yeah. All right, interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. So tell us more about Hunger Hurts Malaysia. How big is the organization and what kind of projects have you guys been doing? Okay, so for uh, Hunger Hurts, we are based in three states. So there is um, Selangor, Shalam, um, Pera, Ipoh Pera, and one more in Negeri Sembilan. Seremban, uh, Seremban so there are three states. Okay. Um, the organization is pretty big. Um, we have about 1,000 plus, I think, volunteers. Um, and we have um, six uh, projects that we have done um, and upcoming one this Friday. So, yeah, yeah, I think that's it, yeah. So what we normally, uh, what we do is we focus on B40 families and urban poor, uh, mainly um, school kids, because we want to sort of break the poverty chain and education is one of the tools to actually break uh, break it. So we try to focus more on them. So we've done um, EduCamp where we have like uh, tuitions. Um, we have tuitions and camps for PPR kids um, where we partner with the schools um, like uh, SK Kepong Baru. And we have initiatives such as Soul Searching, where we raise funds to buy shoes for them. Um, five schools so far, we've helped about, uh, we raised about 581 pairs of shoes for five schools. So it's Very all uh, it's across Malaysia, not just uh, Klang Valley. Uh, apart from that, we also help the homeless. Uh, for Glimpse of Hope, our Glimpse of Hope project, as well as uh, Chance for Happiness, is focused to the homeless. So Chance for Happiness is a charity gig where we raise funds um, to crowd funds from the concert and we use that 
to buy basic necessities, food to distribute uh, during our Glimpse of Hope project. That's how we roll okay. the money up. Yeah. So you combine uh, education and also food into your programs, right? That yeah. seems to be yeah, the correct. main team. Yeah, correct. And, and how about the funding for all this? Like, do you guys raise funds or do you get like donations from corporates? How does this work? What supports uh, all your initiatives? We only raise funds through social media. Um, there's no corporate or anything, just us raising funds through the society. So it's all, it's all crowdfunding? Yeah, it's all crowdfunding. Uh, crowdfunding okay, yeah. Nabil is back. Let me bring him in. Nabil. I'm back. Can you hear me now? All right. Now yeah. we can hear you. Nice. <laughs> okay, so we're just talking about your organization and uh, what kind of projects you've been working on. Uh, so I was just touching on uh, funding, how you guys managed to uh, raise funds, right? So what kind of platforms do you guys use? Is it mainly just people go to your website or do you use like other crowdfunding platforms? Or is it just directly like people banking money into your accounts? How does this work usually? Okay, so our funding funding structure is mainly funded through um, monetary donations by the individuals of our own uh, NGO. All right. And uh, from time to time, we try to get some corporate donors as well. But... Most of the time, we use our own uh, money in a nutshell. Right. So, yeah, Mo uh, most of the time, we just use our own indi indi individual uh, members' uh, funds. Okay, so it's more like people just coming together, pitching in funds, and then just doing initiatives, yeah. right? Yes. Right. And, uh, and uh, have you tried like any platforms? Like, we have a lot of crowdfunding platforms, right? In Malaysia, we have uh, Pitchin, like the one I'm using, then we have Sedunia and a few others that I've seen. Have you guys mm -hmm. uh, used any of these crowdfunding platforms to raise funds for your projects? No. No. Sarah? No, we haven't. All right. Uh, okay. It's just okay, now, uh, social media and yeah, that's it. Okay. Okay, and before that, uh, let's have an introduction from you, Nabil. We missed that just now. <laughs> you got cut off. So let's yeah, just yeah, introduce. Yeah. I... yeah, just yeah. tell us about yourself. Uh, what do you do and, uh, and then how you got involved in this initiative? Okay, so my name is Nabil Nazmi, 27 this year from Shah Alam. Um, I'm basically an educator and um, I joined Hunger Hurts from my friend who is now the uh, co-founder and the president of Hunger Hurts. Uh, so uh, he invited me in uh, back when we were trying to sort this NGO out in 2016. So um, he needed uh, someone who to be the ambassador. Okay, and... Um, I, and uh, I knew him because he was my university friend. So from there, he pitched me the idea and uh, I thought it was a great idea to help the uh, homeless people and to help the people who are in need. So yeah, basically that's how I joined, through a friend. The president of this NGO is basically my one of my closest friends, so I, I joined because of him. All right, interesting. Okay, so for those of you who are watching, uh, you probably know me as an entrepreneur and a community builder in the tech startup scene. Uh, but I also have an NGO background because uh, like my first NGO job was after I finished SPM. Mm -hmm. I was in Sabah working with an NGO. And then after that, after I finished my degree, I went back there again for to continue my work there with them. So we, we did a lot of education and uh, community development work, especially with, mm -hmm. the, with the native communities there. Uh, so uh, I've always been very supportive of NGOs, non-profit programs. I've had clients who are NGOs uh, and I've been very happy to support a lot of the social enterprises as well. Uh, so that's mm -hmm. just uh, one of my passion as well. So mm -hmm. just coming back to the topic, uh, food aid, right? So yeah. there's so many yeah. NGOs and uh, individuals right now uh, doing a lot of stuff in the space, especially during the MCO now. Uh, a lot mm -hmm. of people are in trouble. So on your side, uh, how do you guys initiate these projects? Like, uh, do you have a boss who just tells you what to do? Or is it like a team effort? Everybody comes together and figures out like what you need to do and who you want to help. How does this work in your organization? It's basically a team effort. So like we welcome ideas in our NGO. So once you have, uh, once you have a promising idea, you can, uh, you can pitch the president of, of, of the NGO. And it, most of the time he, he, he would approve it because um, basically we just welcome ideas and effort to, uh, to constantly produce uh, initiatives that we can do to make sure our growth and, and our momentum remain steady. So, um, like the one that we uh, we we were doing before, uh, Kinder Eight, that one was uh mainly, mainly uh started out by Sarah and the president. So, 
Sarah, you can maybe Sarah can explain more. Yeah. Uh, yeah, tell us more about Kinder. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we wanted to create like because everyone is in different states, so we cannot be there physically to distribute the food. So what we came up with is a model something like Tinder, uh, where we match make um the registered beneficiaries with donors. So beneficiaries uh were vetted through by the operation team just to minimize you know uh, minimize any risk or any scams or whatever so once we have um, gotten everything um, then they were put in in the list then we started um, promoting about kind of aid and getting donors and matching them with every individual in our list yeah something it's 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 like that um sort of like tinder matching matching donors and so, how, how do you actually deal with, i mean this is a common theme right there's a lot yeah. of people are trying to do good things mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. you still ha- have to face a lot of scammers and all trying to take advantage mm-hmm. of this kind of aids right so how do you guys deal with that is there like a uh, process where you figure it out like how do you identify uh, the scammers yeah uh for for that one is on part of the operations team so we, even before they um, even before they get the items, they have to go through a process of registering. Like for the beneficiaries, they have to produce uh, proof that they live in PPR flats. So it's easier for us to identify that they are B forty families, especially uh, if they live in PPR flats. If they don't live in PPR flats, then that will be challenging for us a bit. That's why we have to go through like tedious process, thorough process, in order for them to. Uh, to pass the stage to receive the donations, yeah. All right, and uh, oh, Nabila disappeared again. <laughs> Nabila, <laughs> sorry, let's continue. So anyway, uh, how difficult or how easy it is to get volunteers for your program? Because the thing is, uh, you know, I myself have found it's not very easy to encourage young people to uh, get into these kind of programs to volunteer their efforts for like you know social causes. So how do you guys deal with that? I see two very young people here, and I'm yeah. sure there are more young people in your organization. So yeah, how do you guys are. encourage other people to come in as well? Um, we normally just post um post on our personal account. I think that's how we attract youngsters, especially on our NGOs. Then they will be like, "Oh, what's this about? I'm so interested to join, but I I don't know how to join." That's the problem with youngsters now. They want to volunteer, but they don't know how to or where to begin. So I would just like, personally for me, I would just try to explain to them how it works and how you can volunteer. And I would uh, myself just, you know, contact them directly if we have to turun padang for any volunteering jobs like uh, Glimpse of Hope or Soul Searching where we need people to actually help us distribute the shoes um, to the school kids. Yeah, that's how I personally do it. Lah. Like, right. Actually, it attracts people, especially on Twitter. They actually, a lot of youngsters actually want to volunteer. You can okay. find a lot of them on Twitter. Yep. So you guys find most of your volunteers through Twitter? Yeah, Twitter, yeah. Okay, so that's a good platform, I guess. Uh, yeah, that is. <laughs> and how about students, like college students and all that? Do you guys approach any like uh, colleges in Klang Valley or anywhere around Malaysia to get like do any formal programs with universities or colleges? I think Nabil, ada kan? You guys, uh, we have university reps, right? For Hunger Hearts, for UM, IIUM, UITM. Nabil? Hello? Nabil? Nabil. Hello? Yes? Yeah. Hello? Can you hear? I can't, I can't, I can't hear, I can't hear Sarah. <laughs> Hello? Can you hear me? Hello, Nabil, can you hear me? Oh my god, you can't hear me. But we have, we do have rats yes, for. Yes. Gonna... Actually, yeah. started, uh, when we when we was when we, when we were starting out, uh, our main um, target was uh, university students. Actually, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. We can okay. Hear yeah. So um, our our target was university students because um, like I said, I met the president uh back in msu we were studying in management and science university so for every um faculty in 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 our university for every faculty we tried to um expose more about our ngos about our whereabouts about what we do and uh, apparently it matches with the university syllabus as well because 
uh, our university we were looking forward for activities for the students to for the students to join especially um, community service and social community service so we incorporated our initiatives with the universities uh, with, with the universities uh, initiatives as well so we managed to uh, we managed to reach a, reach a consensus and uh, yeah that's how we started out initially Hangar Hut started out with a few university students because that was our main target. Right. That's very interesting. So, yeah. how about any assistance from uh, government agencies or any ministries? Have you guys have collaborated with any of these agencies or are you like on your own, fully private? No, we are fully our, on our own. We haven't collaborated with any, uh, any side of the government yet, but we okay. were... We were involved with the UNGC, the United Nations Global Compact. All right. So yeah, because uh, we did a few um, events with them. Uh, like last year, we went to Singapore for a forum, and even even uh, two years ago, in we just we started collaborating with the UNGC in 2018. So basically, we are the youngest NGO uh, under the UNGC's wing. Yeah. Oh, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And personally, what makes like what made you guys want to do something like this? Was it purely because of this organization that you were so interested in what they are doing, or is it because mm -hmm. you already had that that feel that you want to contribute or do something, and then you decided this is what you want to do? Like, what what started it off for you guys? Okay. So basically, like I said just now, we started this um, back when we were in the university. We we wanted to start hunger hurts because of two things first of all we do need because we wanted to raise our awareness about the issues of poverty rate in malaysia about the homelessness in malaysia but as well as not just we're trying to help the, the situation or the crisis that were happening at that time but mm -hmm. we were trying to improve ourselves as well because we saw hunger hurts as a great medium and a great platform for us to improve our own skills because in Hunger Hurts, we train people to improve their communication skills. We train people to handle events, to maybe um, start an initiative. So from there, you can improve. As a student, you can improve your leadership skills, how to communicate with people, how to do this, how to do that. And yeah, both both of them come hand in hand. So that that's what uh, those two things were our main uh, reason why we wanted to to, to build this. Uh, this NGO. All right. And for you, Sarah, what made you want to join this? Um, personally, I've always been involved with um, charities um, because of my um, because of my mom. She has always been involved with social works. So I've been exposed since I was really young, and I was fortunate enough to find like an NGO that really suited how what I stand for. That's how like I got even more involved. But on the sides, I still help my mom with the social works, partnering with schools and um, helping urban poor kids from the schools. Yeah. <laughs> right. And uh, what is your upcoming project now? What, what are you looking forward to next? So our upcoming project will be on Friday. Um, this is sort of like kind of it, but a new and improved version. Uh, this is where we solely focus on school kids and we partner with schools. Um, schools are outskirt of KL, uh, specifically um, in Padang, Ladang, Chemo. Uh, it's somewhere in Perak, which is like really remotely inside, um, deep inside. So uh, we found out that a lot of them didn't have food uh, to eat during this period so we wanted to help and we have we have the list um, of 70 school kids um, the families of the 70 school kids where we will help la. Um, it's going to be like a crowdfund but not as tedious as kind of aid because kind of aid is more of like matching this one um, donations will straight go to um, the school's uh, account and we have partners. Uh, we have partnered with the grocers, uh, grocer, the grocery delivery there. So they will deliver the groceries to the schools. And because the housing is within the perimeters of the school, so it's easy for them to collect the groceries. Right. Yeah. And uh, how do you foresee now that 
we are living in the COVID-19 world and there'll be the post-COVID world where things yeah. won't be the same anymore, right? Uh, there'll be a lot of restriction in terms of movement, yeah. in terms of meet, meeting people. And when you are doing social work, I mean, that is the main thing, right? To yeah. meet people. Right. Meeting people mm-hmm. is the, the most, one of the most important aspects. Mm-hmm. So how are you guys uh, uh, looking forward to this? Like, what, what, what is, uh, is there any new SOPs that are in place? Or are you still thinking about that? How are you guys dealing with that? Me? Oh, yeah, you I know one of you. <laughs> yeah, okay, no, you, so, um, you can take, yeah. Um, you guys can take turns. Are, <laughs> okay, we, we, we are planning to um, actually organize uh, one charity concert this year. Hopefully, it should be um, it should be on July, but since with this whole COVID-19 COVID thing is it's still happening, it's still under... Um, we we're not sure about the date yet, but our the, this concert thing that we are planning to do is basically we get the underground talents and the underground underground performers be underground or even mainstream all of them are welcome to perform and um we a, a part of the ticket sales we take it and then we donate for the for the we try to donate for the homeless people mm-hmm. and those who are who are in need but but as for now to answer your question we are trying to do everything virtually because yeah. uh as we can see things has things things are still you know it's, it's not being sorted out yet so we are trying to brainstorm and produce something uh through to help through through yeah. the virtual online world right and on your side sarah in terms of marketing like are you preparing any materials uh um, on this yeah we are preparing materials for the upcoming one so we're trying to minimize contact as much as possible that's why we are trying to have like one grocery delivery provider that delivers everything at one location and then everyone gets the stuff so it's like minimizing the risk of contracting this COVID-19. Um, also, as well as you can see, our kind of aid, we we thought really to, we didn't physically hand out the food or the groceries to them. Everything is done virtually as of now. Yeah. And for our basking session that we are going to have, it's going to be obviously virtual. So it's going to be sort of like a basking session, uh, micro crowdfunding sort of something like that. Yeah. Yeah, so even for our grocery aid, uh, the COVID-19 oh, grocery aid, we've yeah. decided to make it fully virtual. So none of the team members have gone out so far. Uh, we have partnered with a no. grocery uh, partner, no. mygrocer.com. So we raise funds, we verify the list, we send the list to our grocer partner and they de- deliver directly to the families. Oh, so that's yeah. what we have been doing so far. I mean, post-MCO, we don't know, we might have to, because the thing is, we are also having issues with verifying people, yeah. right? There are a lot of people who want yeah. aid, but some people, you know, it feels a bit shady. You don't know whether they really need help. Or, but there, yeah. there's in some of the you know the groups and Facebook groups where we are all the other uh, organizers are together, right? There's so many scam yeah. stories are coming out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people are collecting all this aid and they're reselling and all that. I mean, I don't mind if one family gets two pack instead of one. I mean, that's not a big yeah. deal. But yeah. if you collect ten packs and then you're selling, you're yeah. taking that aid away from other people, right? Yeah. So those are the kind of issues we are facing as well. Uh, yeah. So I, so we are also like you know hoping that post MCO maybe we can do better with the verification. Uh, and all that so on your side how uh, are you guys uh, promoting the programs is it purely uh, social media or is there any other strategies they're using to reach out to more people in terms Uh, of to get support and donations um so this is how we do it uh one is through social media and one is uh, basically on our um members efforts so every member will contact their families or friends and uh, yeah, uh, to tell them about this um, this uh, project that we have. So that's how the word spread from there. So we can get like people on social media and we can get different age groups because I know um, for the older generation, they're not really on Twitter that much or Instagram. So that's how we can um, sort of reach them is by contacting our families or aunts and they will contact their friends. So that's how by WhatsApp groups. So it jumps from here and then that's how it spreads, really. Right, so we have a question. Uh, which community are, are you guys serving? So I guess they're asking what demographic are you mainly serving? For right now, demographic we wise- We serve for the uh, B40, the B40 communities. B40 yeah. communities in Klang Valley, yeah, for now, okay. during this MCO period. 
but but you are in few states right like you mentioned earlier yeah that's uh, why so, for yeah. the upcoming one will be in Perak. okay the B- so do you yeah, so do you like simultaneously do many programs or is it like one program each at a time like one after another um each one uh, program at a time plan. because we have our yearly plan so okay. basically yeah. um for hunger hurts we categorize our effort and our initiatives in in three categories the short the mid and the long so for short term for short term we target to provide uh, basic necessities for those who are in poverty and uh, the mid term we try to create more awareness for the um, uh, for the people especially the youth in Malaysia to know more about poverty and as well our long term is we trying to educate and uh, we try to provide uh, educational programs for the underprivileged uh, underprivileged kids especially in the rural areas so uh, answering your questions where we we don't do it simultaneously but we do it um we have a yearly plan so we do it one at a time so as for now because our, uh, some of our plans are put on hold because of this covid-19 thing but mm. when we were staying at home we we actually came up with a, a few other initiatives that were not initially in the at uh, at the start of the year it was not there but since we stuck at home so we figured out those two uh, initiatives that Sarah mentioned kinder aid and the, the one the latest one all right nice and uh, how do you guys encourage more young people to like get involved because uh, i mean that's something that i find hard to do as well i mean for the last i don't know for 20 years i've been trying to get even my friends to get involved in other these social uh, causes right it's very hard you know most most of them they want to support but they don't get involved they might yeah. just donate or it's a one off like on a facebook page but it's very hard to get somebody to commit and get involved to the programs to physically come and volunteer so like what personally what are your thoughts like what kind of strategies can we use to get uh, young people interested in this kind of initiatives well like what like what we do is we try to incorporate um the or the initiatives that we do with entertainment as well like what i mentioned mm. just now the chance for happiness concert mm. uh basically is a concert that is targeted for the youth that's why i said we call the underground bands the the the, the bands who are uh in demand in the underground world so because we're saying that by doing a charity gig we can connect and communicate more with the youngsters in Malaysia so from yeah. there because when you go to the, to the concert that we that we do it's not just about the music we also portray um visual placements to to, to raise awareness for those who oh. come to the, to, to the event and uh when you go to the concert you're not just having fun you you also you're going to be more aware about the poverty rate oh. in Malaysia so that is one of our strategies to to connect more with the youngsters to get their interest more and the other thing is like like that what i i mentioned to you just now it's not just because of what we fight for but it's also for the individual self improve self improvement so like when they join us they be a part of our events they can be surrounded with our, our own community that, that are very supportive it's it's like uh, what do you call it it's like a social group in a way so you can improve your your communication skills you know how to deal with people how to um how to conduct an event yeah those kind of thing and what do you guys think about using celebrities in social causes have you guys tried that or oh yeah we actually I'm, do um now yeah, is that yeah. actually, for that i'm 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 in charge of uh, handling the, uh, what we call social media influencers so we managed to get three social media influencers uh namely uh, Nick Kistina uh Nina Amin uh, and uh, Nia Sipi Lama so they they have been very helpful because whenever we come up with a new design or a new initiative they will promote it so um, it it will definitely reach to more people mm. so that's how we we uh, work with them Market, yeah. these social media influencers and We also choose our social media influencers wisely and carefully because we we don't want uh, someone we we don't want someone who's who, who do not have the interest mm. about poverty. So out of these three influencers that we have got, they are all of them are very uh, genuinely aware and uh, they want to uh, spread more awareness regarding yeah. the poverty in Malaysia. Yeah. And uh, how do you see the situation right now? Now during the MCO, I mean, not only that people who are homeless before, but there are so many new 
you know families who are now being pushed towards poverty mm. and homelessness right uh, mm. landlords are kicking people out and all that so what what are your thoughts on that sarah sarah you want to take this okay um yeah i i read a few um tweets about that like landlords kicking people out and i've actually um got a message from a lady who told me that can you help this person because this law student is being kicked out from the house before not paying rent during the first phase of mco and for me i think the government has to they have to actually give like gazet a uh, regulation that says that you can't do it for like 6 months like how they are doing it overseas so i think we can't really control the landlords right now but i mean they have to have they have to be empathetic not to kick the tenants out but yeah it actually depends on the the landlords that that's how you can see who is who is nice and who is not i i guess that's how that's how for me i feel um but i i feel i i'm so against it lah i mean do i mean why would you want to do that especially now you know like where do the families go and um you see tweets uh, seeing people actually opening up uh, opening up tents bawa the people are flats you know just because you know they can't, they can't, they don't have anywhere else to go so they they have to really address this issue lah i mean it's going crazy <laughs> yeah and uh, i mean even for but are the students all taken care of by the universities because i mean i know the students were locked up in the hostels uh, they were quarantined oh. there and uh, you know the universities are giving them food and all uh, how about students um, who are outside like on their own on their own yeah do they get any aid from their universities have you heard of anything about that Mm, huh. <laughs> that's an interesting that's an interesting topic so because like now and then i i personally like you know help out some students uh, uh, my teacher as well once in a while uh, i'll just put a tweet i say any students you got no money to eat just dm me and then you know we'll get a long list of students sending dms about how they in trouble they got the last 5 ringgit in their bank accounts and all that uh, but during this mco i actually didn't do that because you know the all the news was saying that the students are being well fed and all that yeah, yeah. but even i didn't think about that right the ones who are staying outside yeah. on their own uh, i'm not sure whether are they also getting aid from the their colleges and universities right. i guess that's something I that i should I think, figure out i don't i don't <laughs> think they are i mean unless they are on campus grounds and they are fed and right. you know they are fed and fully they are given that basic necessities but if they are on their own i i am unsure about that i've never really thought about that cuz i've always thought like case okay, uni students are always on campus cuz i was on campus so right. oh. hmm interesting okay, so okay. i will dig more me. about that <laughs> yeah <laughs> check out on that as well uh and uh, have you noticed any other interesting food aid uh, i mean there's so many food aid uh, related you know initiatives in in malaysia okay. especially in klang valley uh, what are some of the most interesting ones that you guys have noticed is there anything uh, that you would like to share um for food uh, food donation drive is it yeah so food it, donation groceries um, food donation drive uh, i only so far i know there's plenty but i've only can i can only recall small changes mine they are doing that and um also uh, monsters amongst us uh they were actually the first few that actually helped during like even before mco started uh monsters amongst us actually sent out groceries to single moms um living in ppr flats who has lost their jobs or um pay cuts or even laid off uh, i mean laid off or pay cuts stuff like that yeah that's that's one of the ngos that i know that helped even before mco started all right okay so we have a question for the education program what content do you guys focus on academic or life skills okay for the education program we we focus on both actually academic and life yeah. skills so basically we have our own module uh we have yeah. this one initiative that we call the um ppr free classes so we what we do is we go to the um PPRs and uh, on the weekends, and we try to uh, get the underprivileged un- underprivileged students around, and we gather them in one room, and we have our own set of module. What we do is we try to educate them the importance of um, language, for example, English, 
and also problem solving questions. So it can be scientific, it can be mathematical. Um, like the last time we we went there and we gave them like a balloon and we we asked them to find find a solution how to drop a balloon without uh, popping it. So it's some that that is one of the examples of activities that we do. So. Um, we started out with the academic part, and then eventually we tried to get them to engage more with us, try to uh, communicate more verbally with them so that they can share with us uh, what have they learned during this module and uh, what is the, the difference between our educational program uh, compared to what, what is being taught uh, in their schools. So yeah, so basically we, we target both, uh, both academic and life skills as well. And how's the response from the community that you're serving, uh, the kids and also their family members? How do they see your programs and how supportive are they? And uh, what do you think about Yeah, what, what's, what's your thought on that? Yeah, so far it has been good. Um, most of the families, the, they, they thank us because uh, most families in the PPRs, they don't have the mm. uh, capacity, financial capacity to send their students to extra classes to uh, additional classes for example tuitions they don't have the funds for to, to send their their, their their children to tuition so what we do is um basically try to target them more uh, on the modern learning modern ac academic uh, programs like for example we this there's this one english class where we teach them basic grammar and then we ask them to talk more narratively like for to, to to engage them more with the other students in the room so the parents they told us that um is good because basically they these kids they've never experienced this kind of lessons before in their life this they 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 only been fed by the education in schools in in their in their uh, primary schools that's all and there's another question uh, in the PPR communities. Are the kids keen to learn English? Yes. Okay. They are. Um, Depends. Some of them are keen and some yeah. of them are not. It's hard to pinpoint exactly. But I would say half of them are keen and half of them are not. But the thing about this is um, they are keen to learn, but it's just it's too challenging for them because they didn't uh, they were not exposed to English at a very young age so they they know that they know the importance of english the significance of english but they thought that it was too late for them to learn but actually it's not okay so what we were doing is we try to um we try to teach them little steps first you know like basics like what i said just now just you know the nouns the verbs the adjectives and then um slowly i can see that they were uh showing more interest in the lessons but of course it takes time because we do it like once a week okay. um but i'm sure the we, we those who the students who are keen we always go back to them and teach them more but these are uh, focused only on students how about the adults uh, is there any programs for adults in terms of english uh, classes or anything for now no for Just adults just... is it yeah oh, as for are now, you guys we, doing anything we, okay. we, we only we, we only target for the students who are in primary school because right. uh, be even, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, even on Twitter, right? I've seen a lot of discussions about uh, English language now and then it comes up, and mm -hmm. you know, some of the ridiculous excuses people give are like, "This is basa panjaja. We shouldn't be learning English. You know, it's not important <laughs> for Malaysians and all that." You, you, and you see that quite often. Yeah. Uh, if it's a one-off thing, it's fine. But you see that uh, it's a very repetitive thing. So many people have that same mentality. So, do you guys face those kind of like rejections uh, when you? Uh, meet your your like audience. What? Like, have you have you had those kind of experiences when you're on the ground? Do people say like no to English? So far, I've um, never. It depends because the the, the, the PPRs that we go, you know, the, basically uh, the families who live there are are the from the low income families, right? So yeah. it's in some is it is somewhat is in their nature that. English is, they, like I said, they know it's important, but they were just, yeah. they, they didn't have the effort to actually okay. learn because their circle, their, their, communi their community there talks in BM all the time. They do mm -hmm. not speak in English at all. So the, the, the people there, the students especially, they feel very intimidated 
to practice English there. So what we do is we try to inculcate and we try to to tell them that the, you don't have to have this mindset. You know, it, 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 regardless of what community you live in, you can always try to learn English. But yeah, there were some some students who were reluctant to learn because you know it's not they they, they told us that it's not really important, it's not really practical because they were not they see it not practical because they don't they don't they don't use it as a as a daily language. And they were they were not they were not told to to use it as a daily language. That that I think that is the problem that we have to tackle. Basically the mindset in the community. They don't see much importance of using English really because everyone around them use uh, uses uh, BM as a a uh, way to communicate with each other. So I think that's the problem in Malaysia. Yeah. Okay. And how about uh, other communities? Like, have you guys worked with any of these uh, our undocumented, uh, you know, migrant workers or or refugees? Any experience with those communities? So far, we haven't yet. No, not no, yet. We, we only no. focus on the B forties. B forties. Okay, so exclusively uh, Malaysians. Malaysians and also yes, homeless farming. Like homeless, okay. we meet some foreigners, like you know, okay. who were human traff um, who got here through the human, who were human traffic, okay. agents. Yeah, through agents and stuff. So that that's the uh, furthest we went. Yeah. Right, and uh, like, it's the same kind of response from them. Do you see any difference between like Malaysians and any other foreigners who are like you know getting like assistance from you guys? Um, sorry, in terms of what um, difference? Like in terms of like, you know, uh, whatever programs that are doing, is there a difference yeah. in response from like the migrant communities or foreigners compared to our local Malaysians? Mm, because we only help like uh, ho for foreigners who are homeless. So we don't really, um, we're, we're not really involved that much as we are with the B40s. So it's like right. a one-off thing with the homeless. Instead of the B40s, we try to like um, move move forward and look, you know, go get get more involved with them. So um, those programs that you do in the PPR is that like a regular yeah. thing, like a weekly, monthly thing, or is like um, yeah, it was a weekly of... thing, right, Nabil? Yeah, it was a weekly yeah, thing. Yeah, it it uh, was yeah. a weekly thing for us, and it spanned for about two three months. And then okay. we put it put it on hold. We paused it for a while because we were focusing on another initiatives, and uh, actually we were targeting to we were targeting to proceed with 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 the PPR free classes. But then this COVID nineteen thing happened, so, mm. so we have to put it on hold as for now. So how does that usually work? Like, do you get volunteers or are they like teachers? So do you need certain qual qualifications to be like a trainer for the programs? How does that work? Oh. Okay, so we get our volunteers because the previous volunteers who joined us, they sign up through Google, Google form. So we will just randomly contact them, and if they're interested, they will come. And then from our own team, we get a few teachers or maybe a few students who were learning, uh, who were uh, academic majors, to um, to go to the PPR and try to share with them what they can, what they can offer to the table. Like I said, we started in the in the university, so we have a community of um, Tassel teachers, Tassel students, um, basically educators, early childhood. So we just we reached to these individuals, and yeah, most of them are, were, were very cool, and they were very willingly to join because they wanted to get more experience in teaching as well. Not just teaching, but basically challenge themselves to teach um, a more challenging crowd. I would say, so yeah, they were very welcoming. So when the volunteers join, you give them your module and then they run the yeah. programs using your modules, right? So who, who developed yes, this module we, actually? We, we will have, we, yeah, we will have our meeting first and then we will explain right. about the modules, like the step-by-step, -step, uh, like what, what, what subjects, uh, the, the duration of the class. And um, because the, the, the classroom is not really, it's not that big. I mean, the amount of students in, in one, particular, one particular class is about 10 to 15. Right. So... Uh, yeah, we, uh, once the module has been explained, we just go and we we just try to experiment with our methods. And so far, we the the, the reception was very good. And and where is this module from? Is this developed in house? Yeah, it's in house. And uh, we we have friends who 
in universities and uh, some of them are school teachers like myself I'm, I'm i'm teaching in a secondary school so we brainstorm on how to prepare the uh, the modules so yeah. we try to make it interesting and not to and not to focus on the academic like what i said just now um, so we incorporate uh, games, interactive activities as well, because we know that we can't just go straight facts and figures with the students. So that's I think that's what makes our modules a little bit different. It's something like a university module, but the difficulty level is really beginner. Right. So if someone wants to become a volunteer and join your program, so how, how do they approach you guys? Can they just go to your Facebook page and drop a message or do they have to uh, go to your office? How does this work? No, you can just go on our website. There will be a sign up as a volunteer. So you click that or you can just DM us and we'll tell you what to do. There are, there are three platforms. Either you contact us through social media and we will help when we will tell you what to do. Or you can just go straightly to our website and sign up as a volunteer. Or you can use uh, Mighty Networks. Uh, it's a it's an app that connects uh, volunteers for a lot of uh, NGOs. Um, so you can sign up there as well. So you get an, I mean, I think it's easier for you to sign up through Mighty Networks because you get notifications for every upcoming uh, volunteering program, not just from Hunger Hurts, but any other NGOs that you want to be a part of volunteering. So it can be a one-off thing or you can join as a member. Um, so yeah, there are three platforms out basically. Right. And uh, in terms of your upcoming program, you said it's going to be in Pera, right? Chamor? Yes, correct. So we'll, so are you guys uh, handling that as well from here or do you have like another team in Pera handling that? So we have contacted the headmaster of the school um, and also the grocer. So we are doing everything remotely from our homes. Yeah. And just um, the operation team will just like um, segregate each each team does what like for me I'm doing marketing and creative we are joined and operation team mostly operations do the logistics and all those uh, delivery services and um, connecting um, and just um, what do you call it um, banking in the money and telling uh, and and also going through the financial statements and everything lah. Basically, that's what they do, yeah. Okay, so the whole operation is now remote? Yes, correct. So how, how, how long are you guys, uh, uh, you know, or, or like what's your view? How long it's going to continue this way? Do you think you'll be able to go back on the ground and do any programs or do you I think mean, we'll be stuck? Looking at the we current condition, I don't think so. It's really like, hard to tell. Yeah. It's really hard to even tell. Today, but... Even today, I went to work and it's very like, hmm. It's like a zombie land. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm I, I'm not leaving my house for a while, so <laughs> I'm not going back to work. <laughs> so, anyway, how how do you think uh the fact how how much does it affect the effectiveness of your programs? Do you think doing this remotely this way is going to make it less effective because you know you're not directly meeting your you know the the community that you're serving? Mm. What, what do you think? Mm, I think for I for think us. That, um... mm -hmm it challenges us in a way because we've never really thought of doing mm -hmm. an initiative like 100 based on online and in the virtual world so uh is i can it's somewhat like a blessing in disguise because now we already know like another strategy to tech to, mm -hmm. to, to, to do an initiative 100 based on online but of course we miss physical interaction with the the people the and the people on the streets but since there's nothing we can do now, but I, I hope we can like maximize and optimize what whatever we can do with this online initiatives that we are doing. Right. Mm. And we have another qu question. Your this is more like a comment first. Your project sounds awesome. Now that you've proven it works and people want it, how do you scale this so that you can grow ten times or hundred times the impact of your initiative? And what do you need from government or private sector or civil society and the right yet to make this happen? What do you think? Um, for me, basically, is we just want to get more people on board. Just as long as we we can uh, we can reach to more audiences, we get to uh, promote the awareness to more youngsters, especially. I think we're gonna do more great things in the future because Hunger Hood started out four years ago with less than ten people, but now it has more more over than four hundred people. 400 volunteers 
And uh, I think if we double up our effort, if we, double, if we double up our initiatives, we our main objective, our main goal is try to just basically get more people to join us, and uh, and uh, hopefully establish ourselves to be uh, one of the uh, NGOs that uh, that one of the frontiers in the combating poverty. Right. And uh, how about for the other like you know corporates or governments? What kind of support do you think uh, you know it'll be nice to have from them because. Uh, this audience that watching this mainly on the Open Coffee Club group, uh, it's a bunch of okay. entrepreneurs. We have investors, we have a uh, government uh, agency reps, we have a lot of corporate reps. Uh, it's a very diverse community of entrepreneurs and people who are in the entrepreneurship community. Uh, so there might be somebody very interesting watching this who can probably you know contribute to your projects. So if you can share, you know, what would you expect if there's a government agency out there who are interested in your programs? Uh, what kind of assistance do you think they can provide you? Or if it's a corporate. Mm -hmm. Basically, what we hope for in in terms of assistance, because there were times that we face difficulties in terms of the funds, and I have to be really, really blatantly honest about this, because the last time I I did the uh, chance for happiness concert, that was a pretty much challenging because we didn't get any sponsorship, but we managed to crowdfund and uh, we managed to uh, get some friends in and uh, basically just like our small circle of group to help us um, especially for like char a charity concert that needs a lot of money because we need to book the venues we have to pay the bands and stuff so perhaps in assisting system in, in terms of funds and in terms of um, creating awareness for our NGO because I believe that hunger hurts needs more uh, needs more people to join in and uh, especially the youth because I hope we the hunger hurts will grow more in the next five to ten years. So yeah, basically uh, funds and support. Hmm. Um, I think for me, I think we should also venture like um, like the question said what do you need from government, private sector, civil society, and the rakyat, right? Um, looking at the kids, especially outskirts, they're not, uh, especially the poor areas, um, I would say, like, in Perak, like, for instance, the, the school that we're helping, they don't have the technology to, um, to do work from home. I mean, like, school work, they, they can't do it virtually because most of them cannot afford phones and laptops and stuff you know gadgets and devices that they can learn remotely from their homes so i think for me like we can definitely partner up with someone who, who can fund laptops even like um phones or whatever so that these kids can actually have access to um education and so that they are not like you know they have like one year of gap of not learning anything so i think from there like we definitely can do that and also like for ppr flats we can have um we can help build um, a library or like a tuition center like a tuition room or center below their ppr so that they can have a place to study uh, read books and have access to all those uh, you know uh, materials that we have access because, uh, because we are privileged enough to have it um, so i think that's my hope la <laughs> for that all right, so uh, we uh, it's been almost about hour now. We're talking about this. Uh, mm -hmm. Anything else you guys want to share about uh, your initiatives or your hope for other young people who are interested in this case? Because to me, uh, you know, I I'm very passionate about encouraging mm -hmm. more young people to join in this kind of initiative because mm -hmm. you know sometimes very easy to say oh the government will handle this or NGOs will do that, but you know there's just not enough NGOs in Malaysia yeah, to handle right. everything, right? Mm -hmm. So we need more people to come on board, uh, start their own initiatives and all that. So uh, what do you guys want to say about that? Like, how, how would you, what would be your pitch to other young people out there who are watching right now? Or who will be watching this later? Um, I hope, I, I just hope that more, uh, more youngsters will join us because it's, trust me, it sounds cliche, but it's actually very, it's, it's, it's fun doing this. Because to, to be honest, when I I when I first heard about Hunger Hurts when 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 my friend invited me to join, I wasn't really adamant at the time. But because I wanted to um, uh, explore myself more, I would like to in unlock the skills in me more. So 
my message for the other youngsters out there you just join us and you will um, learn more about yourself you will improve all the skills that you, you that, that you need but also at the same time there will be a genuine realization of the current state of our poverty level in Malaysia because we hit the streets and we see it with our own eyes and so there's no lies behind that so you just for me join us um, we'll get in touch and uh, it's a good community to be in to be honest because we have we have uh, lots of departments for you to join because if you are a creative person we have a creative department if you if you like social media we have a marketing department for you if you like to uh, to, to, to do op or, or more on the operation side we have the operation department for you so everything is catered down to your own skills so just join us and like polish whatever you have yeah i think for me vol um if you want to volunteer let's say you you have this fire in you that you want to help people but you don't know where to begin just sign up for any volunteering program so that you know how it goes um i think a lot of youngsters are scared like oh what do i need what kind of experience do i need to actually volunteer to this organize in this organization and and stuff like that it goes to their head i think they are more like um unsure or takut takut sort of you know so i think for me like you should just go for it like for me i just went for it i'm like i i didn't think twice just go for it um and you don't really need experience um for volunteers once you go, you turun padang to volunteer and distribute food, then you will gain your, the experience from there. They actually tell you, they actually tell you like what to do. Okay, so you give this to these people. So um, for us, like for our Glimpse of Hope, we not only just distribute food to the homeless, but we actually talk to them. And we, we talk to them, ask them like, um, so where do you see yourself in 10 years? Do you see yourself uh, finding a job? Uh, you, you know, things like that. So you interact with people. So that's how you sort of develop experiences in a way. So for youngsters, if you are passionate about helping each other, uh, helping other people, I think you should just go for it. And also, I think youngsters today are more empathetic. I think on Twitter, I can see that. Um, so yeah, I think I think a lot of people are going to start getting involved with NGOs. Um, I've seen a lot of tweets. Um, people are helping each other during this difficult time. So it's it's a good thing that I, I think it's a blessing in disguise. You know, like a lot of people are trying to help one another. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's important to note that a lot of people yeah. will be needing help soon. Yeah. Uh, you know, this this one month plus lockdown has created a lot of problems for a lot of people. So. I'm seeing in the next few months, a lot more people will need some, all kinds of help. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. I think it's very important for young people to step up and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, try to do something uh, as much as they can, right? I mean, you can't do everything, yeah. you can't solve every problem out there. But I think having that energy, uh, you obviously have more energy. Some of us yeah. are a bit too old. We, we try to do as much as we can. Uh, but I it think is young just people a can... <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it's true, it's true, it's true. Uh, but, you know, young people have more energy, right? So mm -hmm. they can probably do more and... Uh, and I think that's, I mean, you know how, you know, stupid people can be so dangerous in large numbers, right? But I think mm -hmm. when good people come together in large numbers, yeah. you, you know, there's so much more that we can achieve. So I think it's yeah, very correct. important that you guys are doing this and it's really inspiring and it's amazing. And I hope you guys encourage the people around you, your peers and people who are watching you. And also a lot of, uh, you know, everyone who's watching this video, I hope, uh, you know, it's been interesting for them as well. And uh, hopefully they would, uh, they are inspired by, uh, whatever you have shared so far uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm, I'm hoping more people will you know start new initiatives out there and okay. also support existing existing projects or initiatives or existing NGOs so I've shared your link earlier as well uh, later in the in the threads I'll be sharing all your links to your Facebook page and also anybody who's interested so to you guys out there if you're interested uh, in whatever Hunger Hurts Malaysia um, does uh, if you're interested in their programs uh, go join them yeah drop us their drop, drop them a line on their Facebook page uh, and tell them what, what you have to offer, whether you want to be a volunteer or you want to give them money or whatever, right? I'm sure they'd be more than happy to have you guys on board uh, and to assist you. So I would like to thank you guys again for being with us today, thank you, for sharing Mariah. all these thank things. You. Thank you so much. Very interesting chat. Uh, and good luck with all your upcoming projects as well. Thank you and good luck thank to you, you so too. Much. Thank you for having us. Sure. Thank you for, for, for being here today. All right, guys. So...
that was a very interesting chat we had with uh, Sarah Mack and uh, Nabil from Hunger Herds Malaysia. Uh, so they are doing a lot of interesting projects, uh, not only in the food scene, but also education. So they're kind of combining education projects with food aid projects. Uh, they're working with PPR communities and other uh, underprivileged communities. So that's very interesting to see uh, young people involved in this kind of initiatives. You know, usually when you say NGO people, uh, there's a stereotype, these are old people, or it's either very rich people who are privileged and they want to do, uh, you know, NGO stuff, or they're old people who got nothing else to do, right? Uh, so it's always very interesting to see very young people, very energetic people to be involved in social causes. Uh, so social enterprises aside, uh, purely non-profit projects are also very interesting. And if you guys are interested, uh, whether it's Hunger Hurts Malaysia or any other projects out there, uh, do get involved, be a volunteer or contribute money or time or your skills or anything uh, if it means you can help somebody out there especially after this mco this post mco post covid world is going to be very different uh, a lot of people out there will be needing help uh, and if you have the privilege and the resource uh, and the skills and whatever that you can contribute it will be very interesting if you guys can go out there and, and try to make a difference so that'll be all for today's uh, show uh, i hope it was interesting for you as much as it's been very interesting for me to chat with uh, these two amazing guests we had just now. And till we meet again in the next live episode, bye-bye.